The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Every single last one of you is going to have a companion. You're going to be assigned a companion. That's going to be quite interesting. All of you. It right? doesn't matter who you are. If you do not have a companion, you will not be able to transact in the United States or, let's say, the, the world, period. You won't be able to. And it, you don't have to renounce anything for that, right? But it will be, in my opinion, the beginning stages of what you know so, you know so well. You already know what the end result of that is, right? You already know that. Every single person is going to have a companion. That companion is going to be your access, your interpreter, right? Your authorization, uh, your everything. Let me give you guys an example of what's what's been happening. The policies are being drafted. Some policies have been um, they've been passed, and it's real. It's getting quite eerie, right? You all know that um, many people opt to uh, educate their children at home, correct? All of you know this. Many people educate their children at home. They don't send their kids to school, right? So they have that in-house, um, the in-home learning, right? Well, there are lots of children who are abused. They are starved to death. All those stories will come out. So how do you how do you really watch to make sure that the child is okay? Well, it's quite simple, actually. And it's something that's coming forward for everybody. The companion is an AI companion. A, the AI companion will check, it's going to have access to you, your health, everything about you. And it will talk to other AIs. So then if you have a child who's being homeschooled, and you are part of the uh, Board of Education, and you have a child that's being homeschooled, and you're wondering about that child's health, well, it, the AI companion is going to have a constant update. And so all those, um, the, the, um, those who work at the Board of Education, the teachers, everybody who needs to know is going to know the health of that child. They're going to know. It's going to constantly report these things. And it will do it in a way that won't interfere with the life of anybody. But there will be no more child abuse. If the child happens to struggle, uh, some sort of, of physical struggle, some sort of uh, interruption in normal you know, processes of the body, the AI can determine exactly, I mean with great precision, what happened to that child. And that AI can report that to every AI that needs to know. So all that's out the window. Now, if a person doesn't say you don't want to be a part of this, right? If you don't want a companion, you will not be able to transact in banks. You will not have a license. You'll have to turn in quite a few things, right? And they're going to figure out they actually have an alternative for those who don't want to uh, go through with that. But for everybody else, they're going to have a companion. Now, the first stages is quite benign, meaning... You don't have to renounce anything to get this. But you know what that is. You you already know what it is. The beast kingdom is a system. A system that part of it's in right now and it works quite well. It does. Works quite well. Why do I say it works quite well? Well, because uh well let's let's look at the holiness that the Lord said we can have and that we should pursue, and let's look at the reality of our lives. We Look at the Bible as something external from many things in our lives. So what I'm saying is that we strive to have faith. Right? We're trying to do right. We're trying to incorporate holiness. But in the meantime, we have fully incorporated all this junk of the world. So let me be real plain. We have a very easy time cultivating all things of the world in a very difficult time implementing all things of holiness. Don't you find that odd? Why is it? Why is it that we can naturally do the iniquitous thing, but it is so unnatural to do the righteous thing? No people are not used to thinking in these patterns. But I want you to start seeing that. Try and see if you can 
solve this in your head. Why is it that we can adapt to all this stuff of the world so quick, yet when it comes to the Word of God, we struggle and strive and we say we're trying and we have setback after setback because it's so easy to curse, to get angry, to hit, to murder, to do all those things the Lord said don't do. And yet we have a language that constantly reaffirms to us, hey, you, you just have to strive for holiness. You have to try to keep your faith. But with the world, we keep everything flawlessly. Somebody said programming. That's exactly right. That's, that's exactly right. From being a tiny tot, we're raised up in a specific way. But all this, the culture of the world is deeply embedded in us. And anything external that will attempt to compete is going to have a very tough time until you begin to see it. When you begin to see it, you'll say, nope, no more, no more. When you begin to see it, you can do something about it. Amazingly, you can do something about it. And amazingly, it's effective. Isn't that something? Amazingly. See, because the world already has you accepting everything they give you. They prove to you what they're doing. Technology is proven. They need not prove. They need not sit down and try to convince you of anything. Because we live in a world where what we see proven, we accept as truth. Well, guess what? That's what the world presents on a daily basis. In fact, it's a formula which makes media very important. It's reinforced evidence every single day for the world, not for the word. That's why I said most of you, I'll say everybody on the planet, just about, is in total compliance with the beast system. They are. They believe it. See, that's why I like the Word of God. That's, I love the Word of God because in the Word of God, it told us people would not see it coming. You know, I often wonder about that. How can the world know not? How can they know nothing until the flood came and took them all away? And so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. How can they know nothing until the event comes? Well, it's just like right now, people are convinced things are coming and hardly anybody is convinced they're living in the middle of it. Can you imagine a child born during the thousand year reign who would say to himself, boy, I wonder when, uh, you know, when revelation will come to pass. What? Can you imagine a child who sees the proof right in front of their eyes? And then they read a scripture from Revelation saying, well, this will never happen. This is so foreign to how we live right now. This can never happen. They will not realize it's already taking place. Have you noticed that our natural interpretation of Revelation is to put it far in the future naturally? Have you guys noticed that? It's almost like, uh, well, let me tell you this. There are two things that always happen with prophecy. You ready? And it's quite simple to see. Hopefully you guys can see it too. When we start looking at prophecy and evidence and all these things to try and get a grasp on prophecy, we'll always say it's coming down the road. Why? Because of evidence. Because of historical trending. That's why. But the Bible is quite clear. The word must be discerned spiritually. Correct? We walk by faith and not by sight. All the experts, when Jesus came around, they could not see him. They didn't know him. They couldn't recognize him. Why? Did they make a mistake? No, they did not. They didn't make a mistake. But they divined the word by their carnal minds. They calculated. They deduced. They used all the mechanisms of common language the mechanisms of mathematics they had it all down pat but spiritually they were blind they could not see you know i often that that bothered me when i first saw that i said wait a minute why did no one see christ coming yet you had experts living in those days and when you start looking at some of the arguments that people have today they're the same arguments they had back then but who saw christ those who were open spiritually to see him. Those who were shut off, believing in the ways taught to them that are natural to all men, right? To all humanity. They couldn't see him. Those who logically deduced things 
I mean, you know, things had to make sense, right? It has to make sense. It has to fit. The puzzle has to fit. And those who put the puzzle together, they didn't see him. But those who saw things spiritually that were likely not accepted, because you, just like today, you have a lot of people, Peter. You know, I, I noticed something else. Did you notice that the disciples, it's not that they were ignorant concerning the word of God. They were not ignorant concerning the word of God. They just did not follow the word of God like everybody else did. Did you notice that? They did not follow the mechanics of the word of God like the rest of the people did. They were indeed spiritual, weren't they? They were spiritual. Look at Peter. Peter was a cussing fisherman, but he knew about the word of God. He knew about scripture. So he was not ignorant concerning scripture at all. But he did not believe the way the high priests did. He did not believe the way everybody else believed. And so his eyes saw things differently. Just like today, you have many people who have a grasp on the word by way of their carnal mind, logically, deducing things, saying it must be this, because everything else is impossible, right? You have those that are spiritual. I would say I'm more spiritual than anything. And it's not that I can't do it logically. I've already gone through the, I, I remember one time, a long time ago, it was back in the 80s, I had gone through certain books of the Bible. I looked at calendars and everything else, right? And I said, now, there's just no way. Then you look at the New Testament and you hear the words of Christ. And he'll say things like, the son does not know when he's going to be sent. Only the father knows. You know, things like that. Why did he say something like that? Why did he say, no one's going to know, but they know the hour? Why would he ever say that? And then you hear it. The word must be discerned spiritually. So you get into a book, Revelation. And you know the famous four horsemen. People look at the four horsemen in many different ways. i tell you something. Because I do not place myself in this common time. I can't see the word by this date, 2024. I have to see the word by the entire existence of humanity. And when you see that white horse, the one with a crown on his head who had a bow, but no arrow, and he went forth to conquer and to conquer and then you begin to see the attitudes of of kings on this earth what do you begin to see and it's the lamb that opens these seals it is the lamb that causes this to happen and in revelation it was a lamb that said the time is at hand he said it was happening so you have some people that believe logically some people who believe spiritually and some people in between and some people are uncertain but I love the way the Lord works because he loves us. He already knew we were going to try to tackle things logically. He already knew that, right? Now, anybody who's out there and they have to do things logically, I have nothing against them. I don't. I think, I think it shows their devotion. I do. They're resolving things. But I also know this. Time has always proven the correct way. Time has. Time has always proven the correct way. I also know something else. It is mankind who complicates everything, not the Father. The Father really didn't hide anything. See, a parable, right? When you go into a parable and they said, well, Lord, why do you use parables and stuff? He said, it's not for them to know. The secrets of the kingdom of heaven is for you to know, not them. But he was talking to unlearned people. But they did comprehend. But how did they comprehend? By way of the Spirit. They have teams who have all the artifacts. Do you know that? Government-sponsored teams with a clearance higher than the president's clearance. They've already, they have every ancient artifact dealing with the Holy Bible. They know more than any of us could ever know about the factual elements of the Word of God. They're going to be blind concerning the coming of the Son of Man. They're blind concerning the beast. The world is not going to call the Antichrist the Antichrist. It's not. And that word Antichrist, I remember one time in my kooky life, I started having these, these series of dreams. And I almost talked to somebody about what I saw about humanity because it upset me for a few years. Now, personally, here's what I believe. 
firmly. I do not believe it is given to man to know everything. I personally believe that not knowing certain things is freedom within itself. I've seen what happens to a person when the hidden world is made real right before their eyes. And that hidden world was always promised to come at the end. There are many hidden things on this earth. Things that people have never spoken and they probably cannot conceive of unless you see it and witness it. I don't believe the human mind is made to even come up with it. But I do know this. If mankind saw certain things that they're guarded from seeing, you'd be hard-pressed to believe in yourself ever again. In fact, I know if mankind saw certain things, they would never rely upon their mind again. And most people would be trapped. They would beg God. They would be so worried about their own record in the earth. They would. Nobody would think. I, I don't believe anybody would think of prophecy like they do today. I don't think they see prophecy like they do today. I do not believe that. Right? Like, for example, the worst weapon on the earth known to people is a nuclear weapon. That's not the worst weapon on the earth. It's not even close. But because no one knows about anything other than that, they assume that's the terrible weapon. But it's not. They assume... Well, it must be that thing that's going to do this, that, and the other. See, that, that's, an, that's why I'm trying my hardest to become a, a funnel for truth, for some of this hidden stuff to come out to the right people. Because God's people need the, the proper tools. If they're going to come up to a conclusion or something like that, at least have all the materials to work with. I know for a fact if some of these guys had the right materials, oh my goodness. They would not rest until they put everything together. But also know this. The Lord didn't make a mistake. Things are hidden for a reason. I do know that the Spirit is enough. I know the Spirit's enough. Why do you think I'm never concerned? I am never, ever concerned about the details of anybody coming to get me. My heart and my mind is on doing the work right now today until I cannot. I trust the Most High to get me when he's ready. I don't even think about life or death that way. I trust God as a creator of all things. I'll accept no substitute. I am brick-headed when it comes to the Most High. He is it and there's nothing else. I've seen many things that many peoples have called gods. It's not in me to call them anything. But there are some, certain subjects, right? The Lord did not give us. I don't need to know them necessarily. I don't need to. What I do need to know, right, is how to continue to refine me. How to identify, navigate this dark kingdom we're in. Right now, you're in a dark kingdom. You're in dark times. Yet you, many people cannot see it. What if someone, what if, what if someone were to say, you're in the middle of a beast kingdom right now? Would you believe it? Would anybody believe that? That you're in the middle of the kingdom of the beast right now, would you believe it? Would anybody believe it? We just can't say we believe it. How, how could you ever qualify that? How could anybody ever qualify that they were in the middle of a beast kingdom? How could anybody ever do that? For me, it's simple. It's very simple. Along this road where humanity grows, right? I remember times when they bought the Bible reading about this, not, not remember. Now, I wasn't there, I was not there, but they bought the Bible to the USA. And people began to read about Christ. I remember people going back to the Middle East to compile the documents yet again, to bring people the Word of God, untainted by those governmental faith factions that desired to control both faith and people. I remember the struggle and the millions who died getting the Bible compiled in modern times. And then when everybody got the Word of God, I remember the declarations in the USA to have Harvard educate everybody in the Word of God and to send them out throughout all the earth. Remember when people 
were concerned about the direction of mankind. I remember when people didn't have too much. And because they didn't have too much, they always had a hope and they were always happier. They worked through their issues of evil, but evil has always been with anybody out there. And so things like slavery, things like, uh, you know, torments that people would put others through, those things perpetuate through history. But this country, finally, they rose up, the good rose up and said enough, all men are equal. And they began to live by that. They did. They began to live by that. And they had resisted pockets here and there, yes. But for the most part, they began to live by that. Then everybody began to prosper. I remember when churches were established and they became a beacon of hope. I remember many, by way of a community, would take part in going to church. I remember that. There was no such thing as an Easter where people did not go to church. There was no such thing as a Christmas when people did not go to church. When the pastors would come by the houses of the people, you guys remember that? When God's business, people were proud to do the work of the Lord. I remember that. They took, listen, they were proud to be a part of a church, to cook for a church, to be a deacon in a church. That was one of the most serious and noble jobs you could have. It was hope. I remember people checking on their neighbor and the neighbors watching out for all children. I remember that. Oh, I know. Because one time I did something I was not supposed to. And somebody way down the street said, hey, come here. I got in trouble there. Before I could get back to my house, the word had already traveled. As soon as I hit the front door, I saw what you did. Come here. Oh, sh- you got it twice. Right? So the whole neighborhood corrected the children, raised the children. Isn't that something? I remember that. And all of that, all of that came from church. Do you know that? Because church was the place where people would come in to meet each other. Where you would see the vulnerabilities of your neighbor. Learn about their health issues and their family problems and this, that, and the other. Right? Which actually tied communities together. And then I remember prosperity. I remember prosperity came in. Cable television came in. And people began to compete who was going to be that television evangelist. And people wanted control of the networks so they could show all these different ministries on there. And then it went from preaching to raising money on a continuous basis. They were still doing the word of God, but lots of money flowed. And then the stories got out of people who held these positions they had a problem with young people or they had a problem with women or they had a problem with their own morals what happened money greed wealth is what happened so the church went from a necessity to an opportunity hey if you become a pastor and you preach well enough and these people like you and they start jumping around you can make a lot of money and then after the prosperity which kind of continued, I remember the pep rallies. Then it became a competition as to who could excite the people the most. That's when the doctrine changed. That's when the world started falling apart. And the church was so busy competing with one another that they forgot about the world. See, because before that, do you not know that churches were involved with city governments? They were working with the drug problem. They were working with the youth problem. I mean, in a big way. But then when the prosperity began to come around, we got distracted. Then technology came. Remember that? When technology came, we were bedazzled. Toys. Grown people started playing with toys. Innovation came. And then everybody wanted to be their own king and queen with their own property. You remember that? That was the goal of every American. It became the American dream for real. To have your own house, your own everything, and you would be the king and queen of you. That mindset crept into everybody. That they could be their own, I'm going to change king and queen to they could be their own gods. And then there was a decline in attendance at the churches. You remember that? Why? Because everybody said, hey, I'm my own person. And then messages went across brand new cable television. 
and they began to program people with these continuous slogans. One of the most dangerous slogans was, be your own boss. Sounds silly, doesn't it? Why was it so effective? And then you heard other terms through creative writing and television. People began to say, hey, you heard this one other phrase that was very damaging. They began to tell people, hey, you, you deserve better than that. And of course, people began to believe the philosophies of the world. How do we know that? Because those same philosophies crept into the church and the pep rallies began, making people feel good about their position in, in, in a moral cesspool, causing a person to smile. At the same time, they're committing atrocities and iniquitous things, causing people to feel it's okay until people got hungry for the church to tell them the same thing they wanted to hear back in Jeremiah's day. See, they didn't want to hear prophecies. They told Jeremiah, hey, tell us how we're going to be okay. Tell us how God is still you know, he, he's still our God. Don't tell us how we need to correct ourselves. Don't tell us anything that's going to give us warning. Tell us the good stuff only. That's the same thing people did. And church hopping started. Well, I'm not going back to that church. All they do is talk about repent. I used to hear people say, it. oh, I went to a church and for the first time I felt good about me. I started hearing that. Oh, I felt good about me. I felt good about me. I felt good about me. Now, the whole time before that, those people that weren't feeling good about me, you know what they were doing? They were overcoming darkness. They were noticing darkness all around them. And step by step, they were being delivered. But then something came along and began to speak with great words. Blasphemous things. And people felt good about their sin. How do we know that? Because when that era came, bar attendance went up. People had no problem with drinking. People had no problem with doing the iniquitous things they were doing. Then the war of doctrines came. When it became, people began to tell everybody what God meant. You'd read a scripture, the, the shortest one in the Bible, and Jesus wept. And somebody would turn around and say, well, what he really meant was, what God was trying to say was, and they would craft these very clever things. And people would forget about repentance, feeling like they have discovered someone who has the inside track on God's secrets. They began to chase, and that's what people chase, their complexities. They like to hear complexities. It's not because, listen, I'm going to, don't be offended by this, because all of us can be this way and all of us can stop being this way. Many of us are moved we're simply moved by the fact that somebody has put a lot together. We're moved by technical details, things we didn't hear before. Have you ever noticed that people have this thing of presenting what nobody else heard before? And that really does draw in big crowds. Now, here's the funny part. The thing you never heard before, most of them come and go, don't they? Historically, they come and go. They leave no footprint. You're moved by it. You're but dazzled by it, but they come and go. Because why? In the word it said that a day would come when men would no longer endure sound doctrine, but would heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears. We live in the only generation that can do that. Do you know that? The generations before us could not do that. They could not heap to themselves or they could not pile up directly in front of them many different speakers we're the only generation that can do that we can heap when you heap yourself something you pile things up in front of yourselves we're the only generation that can pile up teachers but let me ask you this let me ask you this when you pile up teachers what happens what happens when you pile up a bunch of people you listen to a bunch of people and you start considering many different ways not just one is there something wrong with that no it's only something wrong with it if you have itchy ears now hear me on this is there anything wrong with that no there is not but if you have itchy ears there is and let me tell you the difference to pile to 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 collect a bunch of teachers is simply called education nothing wrong with that what's wrong with it is when you entertain yourself with a bunch of those teachers. You're not retaining the knowledge. 
You're just entertaining yourselves because you want to hear something extraordinary. You go get the extraordinary guy. You want to hear something, you know, from the bushes, you go get the bushes guy. You want to hear something sound, you go get the sound guy. You want to hear something from this perspective, you go get that guy. There's nothing wrong with that until you want to be entertained, which means you're just listening. You're not picking up everything that they're saying, because if that were the case, boy, we'd be some, everybody would have run out of ideas by now. See, in the Bible, it says they would heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears, which means that when they put having in there, that means they would heap to themselves. They would, they would pile up in front of them many different teachers that word having is because they want to hear specific things. They want entertainment. If we look within ourselves, we know for a fact when 2012 came around, and you start looking at the statistics of what Christians were watching. At first, they wanted to learn, but then it became entertainment. What happens when you go when you continue to go back and listen to something you're never going to use? What is that? What is that? You're never going to use it. What is that called? That means you wanted to hear something very specific for no particular reason. Well, it sounds like entertainment to me. So again, there's nothing wrong with hearing many different teachers. There's something wrong with listening to many different teachers to entertain yourselves. There's a difference in listening to someone to have application of the word in your life or application of whatever they're teaching in your life. But for entertainment, that's a big difference. That's why I'm, I'm so quirky and weird. I am. The new stuff that they do I guess we're all built differently, right? That's why I'm the person in the bushes. I don't need a pep rally to get me in the spirit. I do not need anybody else's word to give God praise. I don't go to church, hear the choir, and then get worked up. I'm worked up before I ever go to church. There's not, not a problem with that. Praise and worship is good. I just don't require that. In other words, I don't need the external shot to get me going in this I don't need that stuff because I'll I'll not step foot in a church if my spirit is not in that worshiping place. No no. I will respect the houses of God always. I don't go there to drain them, but to join with those who lift up the name of the Lord. Not there to nitpick either. Because we're all human. And all of us have a problem somewhere. So I'm not there for that reason. But my point is the genuineness has been peeling off for a long time, hasn't it? The genuineness until all things become what? Routine. How do you know it's routine? I remember, listen, listen, I, I would ask, I remember one specific service and I was there. And at the end of the service, I went to the back door and I was asking everybody, well, what would you think about the service? What did you learn? Learn anything new? Two people could tell me what the sermon was about. Nobody else could. They were saying, oh, it was good. What was it about? Oh, it was about the Lord. Well, you know, I'm thinking inside, oh, my goodness, are you serious? If you think about it yourselves, how many people remember what the pastor said when the service is over in truth? Hmm? Because that certainly is not the conversation when everybody is leaving, is it? It's routine. For a lot of people, it has become a routine. And they go to satisfy the routine. So what can cause this much change? Because that's not, that's not called progress. That's not progress. Progress is not getting a bunch of people there. Progress is not that. Spiritual progress can only be gauged by the living God. And that wouldn't that be counted in the number of those who are starting to live their life by the word of God, not those who simply profess it, but those who live their life by it. I used to profess a lot of things. That did not mean I was living everything I professed. That's something I had to do. I had to get that Moses. Uh -uh. No, I will not profess another thing until I'm walking that thing out. I'm going to walk these scriptures out. I'm going to know what these scriptures are. I don't want to read them and that's it. No, nope. I want to experience these scriptures. I'm going to know that I know. 
because I could see an enemy. There's only one way you can fight that enemy. One way. That enemy is sneaky. One of his greatest powers is the power of invisibility. You think he's not here. You think he's not in charge. You think you're not in his kingdom. You think that certain seasons have not already been declared upon this earth. If you're blind to the dark kingdom, you're also blind to certain processes in Revelation. Revelation is a blessing to anybody who reads it. That's what the word says. How many of you believe the word? I do. So how can Revelation be a blessing to someone that Revelation does not apply to? It applies to all of us. Do you know that? It already applied to all of those who read it. Blessed is he who reads the words of this prophecy. Isn't that what it says? So how can a person be blessed? By knowing the elements and all that, all those things in Revelation. It's the same reason all those people missed seeing the Messiah. It's the same reason that Jesus had already come, yet all the people who were masters in the subject matter at the word of God, what do they say? The Messiah has not come yet. The Messiah was crucified on the cross. That's not the Messiah on the cross. And then guilt came because they could not deny certain sayings that marked him as the Messiah, but it was too late. It was too late. See, they have writings about that when he uttered, Father, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? They have writings about that. That drew the attention of a lot of those who could not see him before. But when he said that being crucified, oh, can you imagine? You learned that that indeed was the Messiah after, after you were complicit with his death. Oh my, same thing will happen with Revelation. Many will continue to say it's coming until it totally consumes them. They're not going to be able to see it's already begun. In truth, nation has been rising against nation for quite some time. Kingdom has been rising against kingdom for quite some time. You know, where it says, you know, where it says, see that you're not troubled. For these things must come to pass. Jesus was talking to his disciples of a timely thing. Now I could see him 2,000 years ago telling them, don't be troubled by this. These things have to come to pass. But my goodness, what about those who live in the generation in which those things are coming to pass? Do they continue with that same sentiment? The people that undergo that time, what do they tell somebody? Oh, but the Lord said, don't worry. These things must, yeah, don't worry about it, right? These are the beginning of birth pains. I'll submit to you right now. My belief is that the birth pains began 2,000 years ago. That's my belief. See, we've gone through world wars, genocides. This earth was but destroyed twice. How many people know that everything on all the lands burnt up twice after Jesus died on the cross? See, people don't know that, do they? Why don't people know that? Why don't people know that? A lot of people did not make it. Just You know what? Many, with what they found during that time, it was surprising because they could not find life at all. It was dark for 10 years on this planet. Blackness for 10 years. Can you imagine that? See, if everybody had this information, I'm telling you right now, they, they would say, uh-oh. Oh, oh no, no, i got to go back and recalculate some. i got to go back and, you know, because that was notable. But it happened twice. Twice, two times, not one time, two times. Yes, and that is shocking to know about that. See, we do this one thing we say because it's not in our time. It's not valid. We're unable to look at time over the span of many years. We continue to see everything from a tiny telescopic lens of our present day. We can't do that. We can't do that. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the Antichrist comes to this earth? The beast kingdom is in full bloom. People have the mark of the beast and everything in the heavens changes. Yet you go to a certain city in a certain land that has not seen anything yet. And the guy comes out the front door saying, boy, revelation is coming. Y'all better get ready. But the rest of the world is in absolute darkness. And what he does not know is he is the last land to be consumed. Now, wouldn't that be just weird? Just because his land has not seen it yet. He'll continually say it has not come or does not exist. 
How many of you found the Holocaust? How many of you believe the Holocaust is in the Bible? That was against God's people, was it not? Their heads were shaved, bald. They were burned in the furnace. They were burned up, weren't they? They were enslaved, weren't they? I believe it's in, in the Bible. I do, personally, I do. I do, can't deny it. Can't deny it. I believe it's in the Bible. So did many of those who fled those lands before it ever began. They saw it coming. The Spirit was moving with some of them, and they saw it coming. They fled. Many of them fled. Yet, why is no one incorporating that in their deliberation regarding the time that we live in? It's because of our attention span. It's quite short. It is. You guys remember when Turkey had that earthquake and everybody was moved and it was like, oh, the poor Turkey. And I said, you, you know what? I said, people are going to forget it's going to be as though that earthquake never happened. And the magnitude of the life lost in that area will have no anchor, no bearing in a short time. And now nobody discusses the lives lost, do they? It doesn't mean anything. It's almost like something came and swiped that out of people's memory by way of any sincerity you would have towards it. You cannot feel the grief anymore. It's like something stole it from us. You take that further. That happens with just about all events. You hear it, you're shocked by it, moved by it, but I'm telling you now when it's past, any emotions connected to it are gone. Memories connected to it, gone. The gravity of it, gone. It's gone. And these are notable things. How many people have you heard discuss World War I and World War II when they're talking about prophecy, about the hundreds of millions that have already died? about the ones that were brutally killed in war, about all the children that were lost during those times, and just how threatened was civilization then at the brink of collapse. In modern days, you don't hear too many people refer back to World War I and II. It's always something is coming in the future. And again, that's due to our inability to recognize the whole time, not just our time, not just this moment, this season, but the whole time. If you were to condense 2,000 years down into 10 years, every single last one of you would say, this is it. That's what you would say. But because we can't see time like that, because the world trains us not to, and they do that for good reason, because we can't see time like that, we always continue to say things are coming. I'll tell you something. The beginning of sorrows, I believe, began 2,000 years ago. We are not in the beginning of sorrows. Many men have paid the brutal price for the times we live in. Right now, there's an active genocide in five regions happening right now. A genocide, you know what that means? To wipe out an entire race. It is underway. You don't hear that, do you? These are efforts that are quite effective. You don't hear that, do you? And some people are out there, they're fighting things like this. And the world can never support them because the world cannot see that way because they're not programmed to accept things that way. To be deprogrammed from the world is to simply start seeing things like the Messiah saw them. That's all. The Messiah spoke seeing the beginning, the time now, and the end all in one time. You have to start seeing things all in one time. That's why that scripture is in there. God's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. You have to see it as one time. You have to remember what the Lord said. Rightly divine the word of truth, apply the word to its rightful place. That has to be done spiritually because it says so in the Bible too. But one of my points is that how long are we going to continue to say something is coming when we're standing right in the middle of it? See, the grievous time it's building. It's not coming. It's building. Building up. Time is going to prove all things for what they are. I, for one, am not concerned about those. Listen, my hat's off to anybody who researches the Word of God, who comes up with what they come up with. Somebody wrote me about the, the gentleman, Daniel, that Pastor Paul had on. Let that man do what the Lord called that man to do. Let him continue. God will refine all of us. I had to go back and listen to him, right? I listened to Daniel. I did. 
Let that man do what the Lord called him to do. See, the Lord told us something. He said, we ought to mind our own business. He did. And the guy specifically said, I could be wrong. That's what he said. I could be wrong. He was proposing what he was putting together, just as we have done. See, I, I can almost guarantee you that all of us have put something together. We just didn't tell everybody, did we? One important thing Daniel said in there was he said, you have to take a risk. There's risk involved. When you believe something, if you're going to warn anybody, you have to warn them about what you believe in. God will do the refinement thing, but I'll tell you something. Every single warning the church gets is needful. Every single warning. Because it's waking people up. If you're entertaining possibilities, that means you're not thinking about going to the club. If you think that's that word watch, now people differ in what they think that means. Let me tell you what I think it means. When the Lord said watch, watch, when he gave us a command to watch, and when he gave a threat in Revelation saying that if you don't watch, he's going to come upon that person quickly. If I am watching for what somebody above me has given me, then I am in this mode of readiness always do you hear me that means i've left nothing undone i am watching i am perpetually ready for it to come i am ready to act at any moment when the lord said watch it was almost like he was saying be perpetually ready always and then i saw the beauty of it if you are ready for your lord to return you have left nothing undone. You're not slipping back into sin in the world. You're not doing that. You're standing your post. You're in your place. You're not slipping to the left or to the right. You're not falling or stumbling anywhere. No, no. You are ready always in season and out of season. Uh-oh, it's starting to sound for me. Because, see, I heard the opposite. He said, but and if that evil servant shall see in his heart, the, you know, the servant that won't watch, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants. The Lord, if that servant will come in an hour, he knows nothing of, an hour is not prepared for. So it, it tells us if you don't, if you're not watching, you have slipped back into the world. You don't want the Lord to come right now today. How many of you want the Lord to come right now today? Now listen before you answer, because if he comes back and he sees you doing work other than the work he gave you to do, you're not going with him. He already said that. He said if he comes back and he sees you giving meat in due season, you're doing good. In fact, he said if you're watching, you are giving meat in due season. You're giving the right word at the right time. So what's that evil servant doing? He's not giving anybody anything. He has, slipped, he has slipped back into a worldly mindset. He smites or hits his fellow servants, nitpicking, picking his fellow servants apart. When the nature of your task becomes tearing down other people who believe in Christ, you are not watching. To watch how the Lord said watch is to pick up your fellow man, not to nitpick and tear him down. Because only an evil servant does that. The servant that's watching will not allow his house to be broken up. You know that thief that's spoken about? Who is that thief? I know I'm going to differ from a lot of people on this one, but who is that thief? Jesus said, if the strong man of the house had known what hour the thief would have come in, he would not suffer his house to be broken up. Who is the thief in that case? Who's going to come in? Jesus is the thief. He said, I come as a thief in the night. He told you who he was. He referred to himself. So how is he coming in? Think about it. Jesus said he's going to come as a thief in the night. Didn't he say that? He said that. But I also know this. Saints are watching. They're not sleeping. Then the scriptures say we do not sleep in the night as do others. We are children of the day. We don't sleep in the night. We do not. Why? Because you're watching. Children of the day watch. They're not sleeping. They're watching. You can't be caught off guard because you're ready right now today. Because you're aware right now today. You're not going to be caught at the club. You're not going to be caught in sin. You're not going to be caught in these various 
things that the Lord said he would catch people in. If he comes as a thief, he's going to catch people in their sinful natures, and they will not go with him. So to watch means to clean up your act today and to stand your post for real. See how different that is? That's very different. That's very different than giving yourself time. Well, I've got five years to, to you know, to get things right. No, no, you're watching. You're ready for him to come right now. You know what happens to those who are ready for the Lord right now? If they're ready right now, they don't have to go through anything to, to convince them to get ready. Have you noticed that all those people who go through the harsh times are those who don't simply don't believe in specific things. And so they have to go through harsh times to get to the point where they would stand up in faith and be ready for the coming of the Lord, where they have shed all this sinful nature, all this other stuff, where they have said yes to the Most High. Those people are watching. There's no nervousness in them for the coming of the Lord. They don't deceive them. See, some people say, I'm ready for the Lord right now. Yep, nope, 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 nope. If we have repented, and have not entered back into sin again, we're ready. That means if I were to go out and do something sinful, I'm not ready. If I were to still have an unrepented heart in certain areas with a sinful nature, I'm not ready. The Lord was clear. He died on that cross that our sins may be wiped away, not so that we can continue sinning. Those who have a heart to get away from sin have a repentant heart. They're not thinking about going into back to that sinful nature. And now there's an element in the earth waiting for all those who would dare turn backward to the life they once had. He's waiting. You will see with your own eyes, in less than two months, people who go back into their sinful nature. But this time they won't come out. This time they're not coming out. God has been gracious with us. But let's go ahead and face it. We are the ones who have been giving ourselves time to get our act right, haven't we? In truth, haven't we? We have been giving ourselves time. We've been convincing ourselves that we have time to get things right. See, you know what? When salvation is urgent, the one thing a person will not do is say, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to give myself time. I know the Lord won't come back for at least another 50 years, so I'm not going to worry about that. Well, if it's a worry, why would you leave it undone and you're following Christ? How do I know that? Because I did that once. Oh, I did that once. I know that mindset. I know what that mindset is. Did that once. Did it twice. Three times. Yep, the, the song. Three times a lady. Yeah, I did it. I know what that mindset is. And I know with that mindset, you'll never get straight. Because you'll always give yourself room for iniquity. Hence, you'll always struggle. You'll always fall short. You'll keep falling and stumbling. When everything goes wrong, you'll say, what's the use of maintaining righteousness? That's what you'll say. See, with a person who is really pursuing righteousness, when everything goes wrong, they say, yes, Lord. They don't say, what's the use? They say, yes, Lord. If they lose everything in their life, they say, Lord, I trust you. See, the real faith of us will be bought out. I'll tell you right now, some people have no faith in the Messiah. They have no faith in the living God. Because if somebody's life were stripped of everybody in it, would they still believe? We're going to see. We're going to see. We're going to see. How in the world could I not believe if God removed everything close to me, if he stripped it out of my life, how could I not believe? You know what I would do right now? I would smile. Do you know why? See, you guys are thinking about me crazy. If I lost all of my loved ones, I would smile because I say they're with the Lord now. What you going to do now, Satan? They're with the Lord now. They're with the Lord. You can't do anything. They're with the Lord. And I have no weaknesses. See, that's a believer. What about the unbeliever? The unbeliever. When loved ones are taken away, they, can't, they, they cannot resolve it. They say, why? 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 Because they don't. See, when you have faith in the living God and faith in Christ, you believe the words, you believe the story. And if somebody passes from this world, you know where they are. Anybody in my life that passes, I do celebrate. I don't cry. I celebrate because they made it. Do you hear me? They finished the race. They made it. God found them worthy to take them home. They made it. I cannot celebrate for the living. We have not finished. So we stay to fight the good fight of faith. We're the ones. That, so if we're going to cry, cry for yourselves. 
We have not made it, they made it. And internally, in truth, I celebrate. I actually have joy because they made it. Why is that? Because I believe in the word of the Lord. Simply put, I believe in God's words. Simply put, why do I believe in certain things so strongly? I told you, I do not want to read scripture. I want to walk that scripture out to know it. Also a witness of God's deliverance. I'm a witness of his goodness. A witness of his kindness. I do not want to be one of those who just simply read it and have no experience with it. It's a big difference in that. Some people are frightened about the end times. I am not. The work I do, I do for others. Because I know a lot of people are going to want to give up. I saw myself in a dream one time. The streets were cracked. People were running and screaming. And I was taking children down to this underground, looked like an, a, a, a movie theater. It looked like a movie theater. That was at the base of the building. And I was taking people in there and I said, hey, I was talking calmly. I said, I'll be right back. I'm going to go find some more. And then I looked in this kid's eyes and I said, you're going to witness what many desire to be alive to witness. You're going to see a goodness that only those alive now could ever see. I'll come back to explain it. And in that dream, I was helping people who were once Christian, but when the events started, they lost all faith. They didn't know who they were. They couldn't hold it together. And I was one of those who was there to pick them back up again, to continue to talk about things of faith, even in troubled times. That's what I was doing. The good fight of faith. Why? How can somebody be so complacent with that? Because I believe in the words of Jesus as they are. That's why. I love the words of my Lord. What about you? In this day and age, begin to get into the practice of assisting another person in their faith. It'll be very important. We live in very, uh, some of the things we're bound to go through, they're going to be quite extraordinary in the wrong way. Overwhelming for some. And I want to remind everybody of something. I know a lot of people, they get, uh, they get, they get, you know, they get, uh, they, their chest is puffed out when you start talking about the rapture. They get angry at those who don't believe in it. Hear me on this. Because I'm a person, when it comes to the rapture, that's all in the Father's hands. I need not worry about that. I need to remind all of you about something. I'm going to use, hopefully you won't mind, but I'm going to use, uh, that, that gentleman last night to talk to him, Pastor Paul's, as an example. He was talking about what he believed. He was very passionate about what he believed. And he looked into it. Now, before anybody jumps out there who does not believe or do, doesn't really, you know, subscribe to the rapture, listen to me closely. Every single day, somebody's rapture came. Do you know that? Something similar to a rapture came for somebody. Every single day as somebody's leaving people are leaving every single day people are leaving and people are caught by surprise when that happens i'm saying that to let you know this we don't know everything suppose he was totally right you know what the outcome would be if he was right you'd have a lot of angry people who were against him they'd be, just simply be angry why because he was right and they were not suppose he's not right you're gonna have a bunch of people that will not have heard him in context. And they'll say, see, another false prophet. That's what they'll say. No. If you listen to what he's saying, he told you. That's what he believes. It's no different than believing in a binary system. It isn't. It's no different. When we act on those beliefs, and those beliefs are genuine, there are nuggets of truth all through it. Now, in Proverbs, it says, a wise man is slow to speak and quick to listen. Found something to be true. Since Christ, men have tried to find out when he was coming back, and to date, all of them have been wrong. But a lot of people have left this earth since the coming of Christ. There is a morsel of truth in what God gives us a passion for. We're the human beings. We're the ones that sometimes mess things up royally. We do. We get it wrong sometimes because we don't know everything. But there's an importance to the urgency. When a believer has urgency, you might want to open your ears not to hear anything that you would consider false doctrine, but you might want to hear that compassion. I found that to be, I, I found this talk to be very good. As I said before, I don't really talk about the rapture because I'm, you know, the Lord's going to come and give me what he wants to. But I found the calendar information right on the money. 
I found his timeline of Daniel right on the money because I know about those sabbatical years. I know about the Dead Sea calendar, the scrolls. I know about the dragon, the four dragon scroll. I know about those things. He's doing his best to act on what he believes. That's what he's doing. So let me break the ice. Not one of us is going to be absolutely correct in what we say. Not one of us. But I can tell you this. One day, very soon, people like him, people like Pastor Paul, people like BP Earthwatch, people like myself, will bring to a table the truth we have. We're not going to worry about who's right and who's wrong. We're going to bring it to the table and spiritually go through the whole thing as though we're one person. And in that day, we're going to have a truth beyond truths. And that day, we're going to be highly effective for the body of Christ. And that day, do you hear me? And that day, every time I hear people talk about certain things, they hold this, these, these evident truths. You do. The one thing we cannot do is this. Get locked into our own stuff so much that we kick out everybody else's. That's foolishness. You know, a lot of times I talk to a lot of people, and in my opinion, from what the Lord gave me, they're, they're not just not correct at all. I'm always doing this. I'm always saying, okay, Lord, this person had that, and they were quite sincere. Because I can always tell when a person's trying to get over on me. I'll say, that person's quite sincere now, Lord. you got to show me some things, and he does every single time. All you have to do is act on your sincerity with the Lord, and you'll see it. Now, if a time comes, and I've done this before, where people have predicted things and it didn't come true. I mean, they were quite definitive. They didn't say, not like Daniel, they didn't say I could be wrong. They just went for it. Known for picking people up. I'm not going to kick somebody when they're down. Not doing that. Because I'm not looking for any man to speak any perfect word. I know that God speaks a perfect word. I know that we're down here going through a process of refinement. I know that the more he refines us, the more the spirit we're going to operate by, and the less we're going to speak our own thing anyway. We're not going to lean onto our own understanding. We're not going to resolve anything. We will have all things by revelation, and it will be flawless, coming from the source of truth. Until that time, though, we act on those passions, and the Lord is working things out in our lives. I know with me, I'm very passionate about those things I believe in. And I remember one time, I was, I didn't tell anybody, but I was convinced of something, dealing with a few people. I was convinced of it, but I didn't say a word and I watched. Now, when it didn't happen, and I was young when I did this, when it didn't happen, I was confused. I was like, Lord, you, you put this in me. I didn't just dream this up. The Lord used that to humble me. He humbled me in a way that opened up me to him. He broke me of me, is what he did. He refined me. And when he did that, I was free of so much. I was. See, in this day and age, I don't have to be right. God is always right. I don't need to be right. I just need to make sure that I give folks what he gave me. I personally am not concerned about being right. I'm concerned about giving people what he gave me. I don't need to be right. Because he's right. I'm a parakeet. That's what I am. Modern day parakeet. I'll repeat what he gave me. But if he does not give it to me, I don't even like talking about it. I don't like discussing things he hasn't given me. Because it doesn't lift everybody up. There are warnings he's given all of us. They match. There's an urgency in the spirit. He's laid in all of us. He's waking people up left and right. They are. They're waking up. Folks, I'm in this. Because I believe in what Jesus said. And Jesus came to set the captive free. To give sight to the blind. Jesus came to do a work. And guess what? I believe in that work. I believe in his work. I know he's bringing. All this stuff right here is that's coming to a close. We can all sense the season we live in. We know it's different. And if people, the day that people stop trying to be the master of the season, they'll be workers of the field. All its day, because the night is coming and no man can work when it's night. The harvest is ready, but the laborers are few. Starting to see it? Sometimes we're given this energy, this passion. My passion used to be, because if you're not careful, your passion is going to be information. Then you'll become one of those who's forever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. But the Lord wants us to be effective. 
You're not to ever dodge Satan. You're to plow him over as you're doing the work of the Lord. The greatest key I've ever found was in a simple statement. Do you agree with Jesus or not? I wholeheartedly agree with Christ. I do not agree with my own carnal mind. I am at odds with my own flesh, logic, and academia. I am. But what the Lord spoke is the only word I can fully accept. That can't be a coincidence. I've always been able to fully accept what Jesus said, but I cannot fully accept anything else. Jesus spoke a language bound in something that I cherished above all. L-O-V-E. Love is not some weakness. See, because love can have you stand bitter cold temperatures. To stand watch over a small child or someone who can't take care of themselves. To make sure they can sleep and you will not sleep the whole time. You're standing guard. That's what love is. Love is not some weakness. Love is something that many more of us need. Love will have you watch the development of a person without criticizing them, but you'll stand by to assist them when they ask. You'll never be intrusive. That's love. It is love to see somebody else's process, how they get up and how they fall down and get up again, how you can know things before they ever get into it, but you already know unless they ask for help. Unless they ask for help, you're to stand by. You get those things they cannot see. You fight tooth and nail that their process can be finished. You lift them up when they ask for assistance. You endure all rebukes. Disrespect whatever else comes from the person. Standing ready to assist them at any given moment. That is L-O-V-E. There's no other power that can have a person. Stand watch over another person ready to assist them even when they have spit in your face. That takes strength. That takes absolute resolve. That takes something real. And just like the Word of God says, with man it is impossible. Not with God it's not. With man it is. We live in a time now where many things are going to fall apart. Things are not going to look like. They're not going to look very hopeful. You know, the Lord told us that things are not going to look hopeful. The Lord told us that even his own children, had he not, had he not intervened, they would have lost it. He already told us that. He already told us things would be so deceptive if he had not intervened. We would have been fully consumed in deceits. He already told us that, didn't he? That's the time that's coming. Many are going to be tricked, fooled, totally drawn in by false Christs and false prophets. A false Christ and a false prophet is somebody who says something very correct, but they're going to ask you to follow something different than Jesus. Now, it's not going to be the same Christ they're talking about. Even right now, I'm telling you right now, there are people who are preaching the gospel, but it is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's something else. Something that's causing people to live a duality and to be comfortable with it. Let's put that to the test. You ready? If you can hear me. How many people like it when you hear the word of God, enjoy yourselves, have a good time? And you go back home with a smile on your face. And everything was agreeable. I'm going to be the first to tell you I don't like that. If it does not convict me, how did it come from the source of all truth? If it does not stand against my flesh, how can it be the word of the living God? No, no. God's truth always carries conviction. It will always condemn sin. And it will always overcome darkness. That's what God's word carries. It's going to point out things that you don't want to hear. I do not want to go to listen to anybody who's going to say what I want to hear. No, no, I don't want that. Because if I go to somebody and they're saying everything I want to hear, I can learn nothing. Give me the conviction. Show me the spots and the dots and the wrinkles. That's what I want to hear about. I'm going to get ready because the Lord is coming. And I do not want someone that says, oh, yeah, you look okay. Go ahead. No. I want somebody to say, ha, huh, you got your, your, all that's wrong. That's what I want. Because the Messiah is coming. He's coming back for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. He's working things out in our lives. 
I don't want a word that comforts my flesh. I need the word that's against the flesh. Because Jesus never spoke to make sin okay. He never spoke to make sin okay. He convicted us, didn't he? He convicted many, didn't he? I love correction. Correction means I still have favor from the Most High. When somebody points out something in me that shouldn't be there, it means the Most High is still working with me. And I will never take that for granted. Because when time runs out and a dark kingdom is fully immersed and that Antichrist figure comes forward, we know during that time that a fulfillment will have come, don't we? Never forget the statement, that day shall not come, lest there come a falling away, and that man of perdition be revealed. If you don't know who the Antichrist is, certain things will not come. So we know we live in times where things are going to be presented, because all of you know that you were born in a time when you would see the unusual things. You cannot deny that. Nobody hearing me can deny that, unless you're 200 years old. You cannot deny it. You knew when you were born. You saw things differently. You saw the contrast when everybody else was, was celebrating and everything else, but you were in a different spirit altogether. You saw hypocrisies you have never pointed out to anybody. You were born with your eyes open. You could see the state of the world. It's not that you fell for the world. You were trying to survive. Oh, and the icing on the cake. You didn't even like this world. Many of you were able to talk to people much, much older than you, but you had a problem talking to those who were the age you are. Now, how many? How many out there? How many out there find it easier to talk to mature people, but you have little in common with people your age? Come on now, come forward. Go ahead and let me know. Can't you see what generation you are? You're the generation that sees, and the Bible speaks about you. In the Bible, it says the generation that sees all these things, that generation. No, it says the generation that begins to see these things, that generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. You are that generation. You know what that means. You better get ready for a compression of events. Instead of the years dragging on and everything else, can't you see what's happening? People are looking for prophecy to happen one by one by one. Right? No. Nope. You're going to see a compression of all those prophecies. You'll begin, you'll begin to see them happening all at one time. They're initializing. These prophecies are initializing. You're starting to see them in the Middle East. You're starting to see them in government. You think it's a mistake that the USA is in the position it's in right now? Don't you know we're in the times when all people reject their governments, when they hang their leaders? Don't you know that? We're in the generation now where the leaders will speak words of blood. The scroll says, they'll lift up their faces to the heavens with a mouth full of blood. Having spoken poisonous words, they're going to pay for how they spoke. They will become the victims of their own speech, and you will see it, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. You're the ones. For the angel stands upon the sea and upon the land, and he declares time will be no more. You're that generation. Now, everybody has their idea of how these things unfold, but you're in the middle of something. You are in the middle of something. You still have eyes to see what nobody else can. You have ears to hear what nobody else can. It's comfortable hearing it like everybody else, but that's not what you're called here. You're not called to hear it like everybody else. You're not. Just like you were not called to see life like everybody else. You were not. You already know that. So don't start slipping up now, fitting into the decent, you know, even man-made pieces of what you see before you, uh-uh. You were called strange, peculiar. You were called by the living God to be different than everybody else around you. That's why you saw things differently. That's why you're so strange now. That's why there are certain comforts you cannot accept. You didn't tell anybody that one, did you? I know why you reject certain things, because there are certain comforts you're not allowed to indulge in. You didn't tell anybody that. That's something that you know that you didn't express to anybody else. Did you? You didn't tell a soul that one. Let no one separate you from the words of Christ Jesus. Do you hear me? Let no one do that. You know what you're called for. You are keepers of those words. Let the Lord finish his process in your life. 
because time itself will be compressed. Things will happen faster and faster. You're called to make a difference. You're not called to observe the change. You are part of that change. The Lord knows what he's doing. So don't become the expert on your own limitations and everything else. Leave that in your father's hands. But continue to fight the good fight of faith. Standing in faith. Watching always. Being ready. You might want to do it for real this time. Because what you suspected for so long is unfolding quickly. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemous. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved? If you're not willing to repent, and the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. 